On your Wednesday episode of Locked On Raptors, the NBA's conference finals are upon us, which means we get to play the game of what shared DNA do these teams have that the Raptors can co-opt going forward. We do that with Katie Heindel coming up on today's show. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Wednesday, May the 22nd, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the Hell website at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server, a beautiful haven for sickos just like you who love the podcast, who love the Raptors, who love talking about the draft, who love talking about the stuff you're cooking up in the kitchen. It's a lovely little listener family we got building around the show. The link to join the Discord is in the description. It's free to join. As always, we'd love to see you there uh, of course you can find the show for free wherever you get your podcast follow subscribe rate review on the audio side of things it's much appreciated you can also go to the youtube channel subscribe and hit the notification bell when you do that you'll get a heads up via push notification every single time the show is about to premiere or go live you can join the live chat mess around in there with fellow sickos who you know some of there's some crossover with the discord but that it's, it's kind of its own little sicko world over there in the live chat plenty of ways to engage with the sickos who listen to locked on raptors just like you thanks in advance for doing that today's show is brought to you by our friends over at game time down the game time app create an account use the code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply all right on today's show the conference finals are rolling on pascal siakam is doing very good things and some questionable things for your indiana pacers you've got the wolves and the mavericks taking uh their their series to uh, what dallas tonight minnesota minnesota it's very exciting uh those fans are going to be absolutely insane uh of course the celtics went up one last night one at one oh last night over the pacers and with the conference finals going on it feels like a good time to take stock of What's working in these playoffs? What are the things that the Toronto Raptors, who are hoping to one day build to be the type of team that can be in a conference finals, can sort of build upon and co-opt and replicate, et cetera, et cetera. Here to talk about all of that is our dear pal, Katie Heindel from Basketball Feelings and from Believer Mag. How's it going, Katie? How are you? It's going good. Sorry for that face I made when I came in. The intro, like, froze. Oh, <laughs> as it was like starting so i had no idea for a moment where i was in space and time well we have the screen cap for the thumbnail uh already Don't in the bank which is it. very exciting <laughs> katie I, I i'm a tyrant when it comes to choosing the, th the the thumbnails and i will do what i please uh i know i did i did well every time i do Catherine's pod Catherine eicher's pod she always mm -hmm. picks the nicest thumbnail of me and i tell her i'm like oh i'm so used to Sh sean's choices <laughs> It's a treat when someone is like, no, oh, this seems like a good still. You see, I, I, if I didn't also pick insane pictures of myself, I, I would feel <laughs> a little more bad. But like yesterday, I picked one where like my eyes were closed and it looked like I was trying to sing a song uh, like from memory or something like that. So uh, I, I'm an equal opportunity bad thumbnail chooser for Fair. our guests and myself. Fair. Um, yeah. Katie. Let's talk playoffs, shall we? Mm -hmm. um, we saw last night, game one, Celtics Pacers. Damn shame the Pacers couldn't pull that one out. Um, you know, some interesting foul, non foul, contest, non contest decisions late from Pascal Siakam. A lot of other extremely good Pascal Siakam stuff that uh, made me feel not so good inside. Uh, we don't need to relitigate that, though. Um, I did want to take today, Katie, just kind of run through the shared DNA of these conference finalists, if there is any at all, if there are through lines we can find that can kind of help inform where the Raptors are in their build, their build, how far away they might be, and what stuff they still might need to go and procure for their team that they have yet to do so that might allow them to make a run to this stage of the NBA postseason in years to come. Um, Katie, let's start. I, I want to kind of get into my first thing here, which is mm – -hmm. I think it's pretty clear based on the conference finalists. I think the only one here that you would have said like is a stone cold lock to make it is the Celtics. Um, other than that, I think there's a little bit of surprise maybe that the Wolves obviously survived the Nuggets. Mm -hmm. The Mavericks seemed like they were on their, their, their sort of heels in the first round against the Clippers for a second there. They've made it all the way here. 
it feels like the parody era is just like stamping it's here it's not going anywhere and i think that's a good thing for just like the health of the league and the entertainment we obviously know no champion has now made it past the second round for six seasons since the toronto raptors started that trend um it's uh it's kind of an interesting time here katie for the league and i think the raptors place in it is fascinating to kind of examine where you at with the sort of idea of parody being no doubt here to stay being kind of one of the takeaways from these playoffs what a trend to start that's kind of nice. that's <laughs> that's like a very positive read onto what the raptors couldn't repeat it's like well look what they did they ushered in league-wide parody <laughs> They're so noble. They did vanquish the KD <laughs> Warriors, which apparently is the only level of team that can repeat anymore. It's crazy. No, I'm a parody fan. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like we talk about that enough. I, I really enjoy it um, for the chaos and also for the opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think parody is kind of one of the ways that things get pushed forward more in like a scramble, whereas like when you're in a, a dynasty or a super team era, um, every team kind of has to calibrate themselves to beat one specific player mm -hmm. by player i mean the whole team um but you know in a, in a parody era everybody can kind of develop their own strong suits mm -hmm. um and figure out what works best for them and their roster and the personnel that they've got and you know like their varying levels of skill sets obviously tailoring them matchup to matchup like in a playoff situation um, but i think it's generally better for growth and i do think it is here to, well, <laughs> that's not true. The NBA is so cyclical, so it's here to stay for a little while, and then sure. a super team will finally figure it out. Though it is interesting to watch super team after super team not necessarily understand what the model is anymore because it's obviously changed. The financial landscape has made it really hard that to build too. super teams that have enough juice to get through a season, and mm -hmm. I think... We've also seen with the Nuggets going down, who I think are probably the closest thing we've seen since the Golden State Warriors of the KD era to like an inevitable team. Like it's really hard to just have like the mental capacity to win two championships in a row, let alone the physical health and luck that comes with all of it. Like mm -hmm. I think the talent's more spread out than it's ever been. Depth is more important to kind of your ability to survive and weather injury, which is a thing people, everyone's got to deal with. And it just becomes a lot more difficult when instead of having three stars on a team, you have one or two and, you know, one injury can really derail your best laid plans. I, I think, you know, the, I, I, it seems just really, really hard to build a team good enough. That's going to kind of shift the landscape of the league, the way those warriors did, right? Like it, it, that was basically done because of a once in a lifetime salary cap anomaly that allowed Kevin Durant to walk into their cap space. Mm -hmm. We're probably not going to see that again. And so it'll have to be, I think sort of a more organically built super team. The thunder come to mind as like a potential, you know, we'll see how it all breaks down and where these guys ends up, end up in terms of the league hierarchy, but it's going to have to be more of a sort of built from within. And then you just kind of accept, okay, we're going to be very expensive now. And that's got to be your pathway to building that kind of team. I don't think it's going to be done via free agency or sort of star recruiting really anymore. Um, you know, maybe there are avenues via trade or whatever, but it's going to be tough to do. And, and yeah, the threshold to be that level of team is just extremely high. Um, I also really like the point you made, Katie, about the sort of, the, the the sort of styles make fights of it all almost mm -hmm. where every team kind of has its own way of doing things and that leads to super interesting matchups in the playoffs um every team you know to, to your point like during that warriors era every team was built to try to beat the warriors and that led to a lot of sameness around the nba it's pretty awesome when everyone kind of plays differently is it not it is uh it's cool it's been cool to watch and also like in the kind of adjustments i think when I mean, I know I, I did this a few times, certainly in the first round, um, but like counting teams out prematurely because mm -hmm. you're like, mm -hmm. no, I've seen everything they have. And then you realize in the next game that you don't. Right. Um, I think that's cool. I also just think like what happened to, I always compare this to the Raptors, I think, because it's just the closest example I had proximity wise. Um, and because I think they did this very well, but that, that kind of rare thing when a team goes through um, a playoffs and like the deeper they get into it, if they're able to really learn as they go and adjust and mm -hmm. kind of like almost accelerate their growth in real time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Raptors did that and that's why they won. 
one of the reasons why they won. Um, but I think, you know, we're also seeing that. So even, you know, you someone like OKC, um, I'm the Knicks, certainly, probably the Pacers, but they're like, these aren't like lost runs for them. Like mm -hmm. they've probably gotten so much better in the past four weeks, I'd say than they have in the last like six months, you know? Yeah. Hundred percent. Like the wolves, a great example of that yeah. too, right? Like they just kind of went from this sort of uh, "can we really trust them?" to "oh my god, it's just like a bunch of uh, pterodactyls here to destroy us." It's incredible. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think as far as like a takeaway for the Raptors from this, like I, I do think to me, it's kind of hammered home the sort of feeling I've had throughout these playoffs and into the you know back in the regular season as well, which is just like when you're building a team. Yeah, it's nice to think of, oh, let's build ourselves to be sort of an upper crust inner circle contender. It's really damn hard to do that. And it's dependent on getting one of the seven or eight players in the world who kind of alone makes your team that good. Um, and so I do think the sort of goal here should be just build like a top six worthy team and be in position to take advantage of the sort of abundance of NBA weirdness that seems to be more likely to happen as teams are less sort of stocked with super duper high end game shifting talent. Um, and it's more of a sort of even playing field and injuries and luck and things like that play into things and matchups, right? Like the team mm -hmm. hits the wrong matchup and all of a sudden, whoa, the Nuggets are out of the bracket. Wow, everything's opened up. Um, you know, I, do you have like the similar sort of takeaway for what this means for the Raptors? Do you have something else? Like what, what, what do you sort of take from what we've talked about here and apply it? And how do you apply it to what the Raptors are now trying to do? I don't mean to be gloomy, but it's also made me realize how far, how much farther the Raptors have to get there. Because hmm. again, like, you know, these kind of teams that I think throughout the season, people said were too young or too inexperienced to get there, um, got pretty far. Some are still hmm. in it. And like, even those teams have been intact as they are for such a long time sure. compared to Toronto. So it's, it's been thinking about like, Oh, right. You know, a rebuild takes a lot. It, it takes like long enough to be competitive kind of at home and to be competitive and, and like competent throughout a regular season. And then in the playoffs, like that's an entirely other animal. Mm -hmm. And, and you can only get that experience by getting there and probably losing many times. So, uh, it's just reminded me of, oh, yeah, it's going to be a while. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like you got to walk before you can run. Like I, mm -hmm. I think there's a world in which they find themselves kind of in a top eight position next season and everything's very nice. But then the playoffs become, as you said, like an entirely different deal. And that's a whole new multi year step in learning process. Unless you're the Wolves where you're second year going, you're just, oh, yeah, we're the best team in the world now. Have fun. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, look, I, I think another thing, too, is, you know, the Mavericks and Pacers, like they made big in-season trades and were benefited and they benefited from it, right? The Wolves made a huge trade for Gobert and it took a year, but they're benefiting from it. Um, I think that's something interesting we can talk about coming up, too, is just sort of the rewards of kind of going in with your chips and bolstering your team. We're going to come mm -hmm. back and talk about that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time, the single best place to buy tickets for the sporting events, concerts, theater events, whatever it is that you want to go to. It is the very best for a whole bunch of different reasons. You get incredible last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, and theater. You get flash deals where you can save even more with exclusive in app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. You get pictures of your seat all in pricing, no surprise fees at checkout. It's a beautiful thing. I use Game Time all the time. I used Game Time twice this past weekend while I was in Vegas. I bought tickets for the Blue Man Group, which was awesome, super duper fun. I got all sorts of paint on me. It rocked. And then I bought tickets for the Las Vegas Aces game on Saturday against the LA Sparks, and that was fantastic. We paid like 66 bucks to sit fifth row in the corner right by the floor. It was very rad and all because game time made it super easy to buy those tickets you can now buy your tickets for game time by downloading the game time app creating an account using the code locked on nba for 20 dollars off your first purchase again terms apply create an account redeem the code locked on nba l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n nba for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed 
Back at it here with Katie Heindel from Basketball Feelings and her weekly WNBA column over at Believer Mag, which is fantastic. And everyone should be reading, damn it. Um, <laughs> all right, Katie, uh, I, I want to give you the floor to talk about some of your own thoughts on you know how these playoffs have um, sort of changed the way or altered the way you think about the Raptors and uh, what they have ahead of them as they build from where they are to where they want to get to um, quickly. You know, I don't need to sort of belabor the point about trades and stuff. Uh, using picks to trade for good players is good. Uh, carry on. Uh, Katie, um, what do you got as far as one of your takeaways from these playoffs and sort of the conference finalists and the shared DNA they have that the Raptors might be striving to, uh, you know, have within their own bones. I think it's how they would stand up to pressure, honestly, because mm. we've seen that, especially I think in last night's game, um, between the Pacers and the Celtics, just how, you know, the Pacers, I don't want to say they wasted all those times they spent, like this time they spent catching up and closing those gaps. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a few just kind of executional errors, I think, that sure. they gave that game away. Um, they couldn't, they couldn't finish, like they couldn't close it out. And they do remind me in that sense of a Toronto team, right? That I think, does look flustered looked flustered a lot this season which par for the course absolutely uh mm. but i you think you look flustered when you're uh really really bad <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so i think to me the more applicable thing the more applicable lesson is to start look is to have like these situations that you know last year you would have been like oh they don't know what to do you know if they're mm. pressed a little bit um i think it was definitely more on the offensive end but there were some times on the defensive side where they just like didn't seem to understand where they were supposed to be. Mm. Um, and if they can have less of those, or if you can notice them in any type of execution of one of those schemes and then have someone go the right way and be like, oh, that actually looked quite fluid. It didn't look like they had to think twice, like think too much about that. Um, mm. That I think will be like a <laughs> positive. <laughs> for me but no they're still obviously like leaps leaps away from what we're seeing in the postseason but mm -hmm. i think like that's that's really stood out to me it's just like oh yeah the, the the teams that have gotten here and that always get here sorry especially okay. <laughs> again this, pro dog podcast this yeah, has been going guess, on for like seven years Kim. yeah i'm like oh no <laughs> can't believe it happened for the first time <laughs> <laughs> Especially a team, you know, you have you, a dog, you find it out <laughs> first, like the wolves, you know, where I totally thought they were going to succumb to pressure, even mm -hmm. with, you know, veterans on that roster. Um, but they haven't, they've been able to kind of dig deep and steady themselves when they really needed to, uh, and also be patient and let the game come to them. And I think all of those things would be great lessons, um, for the Raptors to learn. And I don't really have a doubt that Darko and his staff aren't watching the playoffs and thinking the mm -hmm. same thing. <laughs> no doubt. That's like one of the, the great shames of this season is we didn't even really get to see the proof of concept with this team, mm -hmm. like in close games for longer than like a 10 game stretch with the team they want to have. Like we have no idea what their sort of late game process is going to be. I think that OKC double OT game is kind of the closest thing we got to. Um, and obviously some not great stuff happened there with Scotty Barnes near the end of that game. And it was kind mm -hmm. of a bizarre finish. Um, and maybe that's indicative of things to come. I kind of think not. I think that's probably like a learning experience, but it's a shame they didn't get more of those throughout this season to kind of go into next year with a little bit more sort of understanding of where they need to improve late in games, what they do well, what they can lean on. Um, you know, I, I think they have some stuff they'll be able to lean on. I think like, you know, as they sort of work that quickly Barnes duo and sort of find the chemistry there, that's going to be a big thing they can kind of lean on for, for buckets late in games. Defensively, we'll see. I, I still have no idea what they want to do on defense and how they're going to deploy things and how that will translate to high stakes basketball. But mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I did like the sort of hmm for the season to come or for, for from this past season going into next year. And it's just like the tactical stuff with Darko. We really have no clue what the 
sort of like we know he's great in the locker room, kept the room together. Everyone seems to love him. The player development got going pretty well, it seemed. But uh, how exactly do they want to deploy things when things matter most? We still have no idea how he sort of pulls those cranks and levers the way you typically, you know, would get a, a look at that, at least over the course of a season where you have, you know, the same team intact for 82 games as opposed mm-hmm. to little pockets of 15 or 20 games here and there where the team completely changed. Um, another quick thing, Katie, that I think for me is a bit of a takeaway from these playoffs is offensive rebounding seems like a thing (laughs) that everyone should be able to really do and lean into. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, feather in the cap to Nick nurse, the Nick nurse Raptors were onto something there when they basically spammed the offensive glass for two seasons in a row. Everyone's like, what the hell are these guys doing? And all of a sudden it was like, Oh, maybe everyone should try and do this. This seems like a pretty good thing. Um, Obviously Darko Ryakovich was with those Memphis Grizzlies teams that also were part of this sort of early way of offensive rebounding, becoming cool again after many years of the school of doc rivers of, you just got to get back and not crash the glass kind of taking over the league. Um, And I think that's, you know, that's directly informative of what the team has to do this offseason as far as building. They're not big enough. They need more dudes who can crash. Yaka Pertle himself, very good offensive rebounder. I wouldn't say they have another very good offensive rebounder on the team. Grady Dick, maybe for his position, you know, he's got the instincts for it. That's a thing he's always been pretty decent with, but he's not going to grab more than one or two a game, one would think, being a shooting guard or small forward, whatever he is. Um, And so that, for me, like, you look at what they have to do this offseason, they got to go get some beef, right, Katie? <laughs> yeah, but I would. I was also thinking of like one. I love offensive rebounds. I love orbs. I think they've a great been equalizer. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> um, grab those orbs. Well, I guess like in the Pacers, don't technically. I mean, you've got Turner, but the, like Pascal the top seven offensive long. rebounding teams in the playoffs or in the final four, and the Pacers are one of them. Yeah, I just mean they don't necessarily have an evident big to me. Oh, yeah, right? sure. And, and yeah. someone that you're you're saying like the Raptors should go out and get. I think at this mm-hmm. stage of where they are, yeah, that's definitely someone the Raptors should probably look to getting because it might be too much to add onto the plates of the mm-hmm. people they already have. And I think like in terms of physicality, I could only really see Scotty Barnes doing something like that. Sure. Um, Chris Boucher in his day could – could grab a few orbs maybe there's a like a an orb renaissance season for chris boucher left in him he's got one year left That's maybe true. there's one last like ride off into the sunset where he helps yeah. them become an offensive rebounding juggernaut again i one think the more. main thing sorry i might sneeze god this okay. podcast is a mess um <laughs> <laughs> it's really I, hot katie we're all our brains are melting it's, <laughs> it's fine it's understandable i think the main thing for me is um what the hell was i gonna say <laughs> Oh, yeah, is how offensive rebounding can be such an energy shifter. And we've seen that, oh, yeah. too, when mm-hmm. it's like, okay, these, especially in the playoffs, it's like, okay, you really need to stop or you really need to make this transition count or, okay, you blew that. How mm-hmm. can you How can you kind of force, force your team's hand and get it back? Um, and that's something that I think the Raptors should totally key in on because they already have so many of these, like, frenetic energy shifters. Mm -hmm. almost waiting to unleash those skills. You know what I mean? Like, and I, whether that's like grabbing a quick offensive rebound and resetting or just like quickly being able to cut RJ getting somewhere, Scotty being able to force his way in as well. um, They've got a lot of, they've got like the backside of that action. They don't have someone to start that action off. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that could be totally useful for a young team, which is like, you know, they could be destabilizers. I think Mm -hmm. the games where they looked really good this season is when they were playing as a bit of a destabilizing force. And then the realization caught up with them that they were winning and they were like, Oh no, (laughs) what do we do? (laughs) Can't Um, do that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Or just like that general awareness. Right. But I think if they could really run with that, that's something that we've seen like has won games outright, probably Mm -hmm. has won series outright, I think in the playoffs. For sure. Uh, I mean, the Knicks, I think, would have been in the conference finals on the back of their offensive rebounding, if not for their cavalcade of injuries, right? Like that that was like the thing that got them by the Sixers was just like a couple of historic offensive rebounding nights. Um, Same thing in their series against the Pacers in the games they won. 
it's you know it, it's grimy it's ugly but guess what the playoffs are grimy and ugly and you have to find ways to you know again it's like a great equalizer mm-hmm. and it's also a thing that you know, there's a reason giving up an offensive board is like the thing that a coach will lose their mind over the most it's like it's it really is backbreaking there's nothing more deflating and the raptors i think you know, we saw this down the stretch when Kelly Olynyk was their only big and lineups with Kelly Olynyk sure have a hard time rebounding. Um, you know, it's just hard to build any sort of positive juice, right? Especially for a team like the Raptors, where they are a transition team, right? They were number one in the NBA in transition mm-hmm. frequency. They run a ton and it's hard to do that if you're giving up offensive boards at the other end. Like it, it really is the sort of thing that can tilt the balance of a game in you know a way that i'm glad coaching staff seem to be realizing again after a few seasons where it was kind of uncool to go and crash the glass um so yeah i I think you know this season the raptors are 18th in offensive rebounding percentage it's just not good enough for the modern nba i don't think you got to be somewhere a little higher than that as you know the nick nurse team certainly were and how they address the roster and personnel to give them a shot at being that kind of team i think could be uh huge to me it's very similar to like do you have guys who can live in the ugly areas of the mid-range who can score in the playoffs it's kind of the similar thing to that it's not pretty ball but it works and Mm -hmm. working is kind of all it needs to do in the playoffs um we'll come back on the other side katie get into a couple other rapid fire things that we've kind of noticed about the conference finalists that maybe the raptors already have in store and, and are you know ready to build with or need to go and add we'll talk about that coming up just one sec Today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Look, sometimes you just got to have someone to talk to. It's a very valuable thing. We all carry a lot of of different stressors. The world is very stressful. They're big, they're small, but they all can bottle up. And if we don't talk about them, it can affect you negatively. Therapy is a safe space to get things off your chest and figure out how to work through whatever is weighing you down, whether you've been through a major trauma or you're just trying to sort through the daily decisions and difficult conundrums that life throws at you. Uh, it's just nice to have someone to kind of throw stuff off of. They have you know, no agenda, no bias. They're just there to offer you insights and help you find your values so you can make decisions in line with your values to make you a happy person at the end of the day. That's what we're all striving for, right? If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. That's a big deal. Get it off your chest with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedInMBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H E lp.com slash locked on nba back at it here with katie heindel from basketball feelings and believer mag as we uh continue to talk about the conference finalists and how they might inform the raptors as they build from where they are to where they want to get before we continue on with some rapid fire thoughts uh just a reminder locked on sports today 24 7 is your all day streaming channel over on YouTube, you can go subscribe to it. It's free, and you get 24-7 Locked On podcasts covering the biggest stories in sports, local experts, national shows, draft podcasts. It's all there for you. Go check it out. Locked On Sports today, 24-7. Put it on, and don't do any work all the live long day. Okay. <laughs> Katie, um, let's wrap it up here with some rapid-fire thoughts on the things that are working for the conference finalists that either are not or could work for the Raptors going forward i will give you the floor do you have something else you want to posit as a thing that the raptors should be striving for in order to get to this level Hmm. Hmm. you don't have one i can go i mean i just don't want to repeat myself so go ahead okay um positional depth kind of a nice thing to have right like it's you know, it's hard to, you know, sort of get enough guys who can play super high leverage minutes, but we're seeing it now. Injuries, attrition. I think the level of basketball you have to play in the mm-hmm. postseason nowadays is so high. There's a lot of attrition that comes from it, mental and physical. And if you have guys who can kind of fill in the gaps behind, that is going to make a massive difference. You know, whether it's uh, the Nuggets, you know, not having enough bench guys to fill in when. Michael Porter Jr. was struggling or Jamal Murray was, you know, dealing with an injury, whether it's the Wolves having, you know, Nas Reed, this like incredible luxury to bring off the bench when Carl Anthony Towns has foul trouble. We saw the Knicks just kind of run out of guys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was an extreme example, of course. But 
you know, the Mavericks have a lot of interchangeability between some of their wing type guys. They're two bigs who they get to roll out there in Lively and Gafford. We know the Celtics, you know, okay, Chris Stapps Porzingis is down. Well, we can just throw Al Horford in and just basically be the same team. Um, you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to build a team where you have positional depth with guys who can hang when things matter most. But um, I, I think because of the landscape of the league, that's now sort of the thing that makes a team into a super team almost is having just sort of layers like shark teeth, but of really good players, just layers and layers of good players coming in. And I do think the Raptors are sort of on track, right? Mm -hmm. Like they've got like a sort of basis and they have a lot of means by which to add to this team this summer between their cap space, mid-level exception, if they beat Remaina and over the cap team, they have two draft picks, obviously. Um, you know, they can get there. They're not there yet. And I think that's been one of the downfalls of this team over the last two, three seasons is just not having enough guys when the main guys falter or need to sit on the bench and get some water. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to, to navigate if you don't have depth. What are your sort of thoughts on, on that being a thing that, you know, most conference finals teams in today's day and age are going to need to have? No, I'm with you there because I think we also saw that's probably why the heat fell out. Right. And Pat Riley mm -hmm. even talked about that in a season ending presser of just like, you know, they're not a rebuild team, but they do need to add depth. They have mm -hmm. to address that big problem. And I think, you know, as the rounds go on, you realize how many things have to break. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Health is obviously a huge one, uh, but also just having some having like a more than competent bench, having a bench that mm -hmm. can actually like start be like an energy shifter, start something, maybe like if you've got a big point differential to close that gap, you know, while your starters rest, because otherwise those are kind of wasted minutes in the playoffs and you can't afford that at all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think, yeah, to your point, the nuggets are cheap and that's why they don't have, <laughs> sorry, but it's true. Um, you they're know, and... be a second apron team, Katie. They're, they're, they're spending all kinds of money. Not enough. Not enough to kind of shore <laughs> up that bench, right? Because that's something right. that honestly, like that team should have recognized, I think, mm. making it that far last last year. And knowing that those same conditions, that like that wasn't going to happen. Things were going to break the same way. So I think for Toronto, well, now you've got some semblance of a starting lineup. As you said mm. earlier, we didn't really get to see them very yeah. much all season long. Uh, once you get that sorted out and then you can address like, all right, what does our bench look like? I think that'll be crucial. I guess the good, the silver lining of where the Raptors are at now is that aside maybe from Scotty Barnes and quick, maybe quickly, probably mostly Scotty Barnes, everyone's kind of interchangeable mm -hmm. of where they're at, right? Like either want like career wise, maybe skill set wise. So you can, you can, you, that's like a nice, those two things should be complementary to one another. It shouldn't be that big of an upset when it's like, okay, now we've got bench minutes. Like that shouldn't be something you need to roll your eyes at. Right. So yeah, I think that's a good one. I mean, in terms of other things I'm learning from the playoffs that apply to the Raptors, as I said earlier, I feel like they, they're not going to apply for a few years. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel fair to just put those at their feet. That's totally fair. Um, yeah, and the other thing with like depth too is it's not just like injury insurance; it's also like stylistic yes. uh, flexibility, right? Like, oh, we can play this different way, and we can try this different thing. Although I do think the teams that we've seen in the playoffs that kind of have played the same way throughout most of the playoffs, and it's worked. Um, but yeah, you know, which is weird. Up, which is yeah, kind it, of it's weird. Very strange. It's like I unlike if... most years where yeah, you know, teams will have a guy who you know doesn't play in one series but becomes a matchup you know necessity in the next series and all of a sudden you know Serge Ibaka and Marcus Gasol are starting together against the Sixers and stuff like I don't that. know that if like um I was gonna say like that probably has to do with coaching but I think aside from mm -hmm. like Missoula uh you know there's like these are coaches with enough tenure and experience that they should be adjusting mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I don't know I guess they're just riding it out yeah I mean some of them I, I think it's it's fair. They're really good. They're doing pretty well. Uh, it's not to say there aren't like tactical adjustments, but lineup adjustments. I think it's been kind of a strange season where you yeah, know, there, we haven't seen a lot of that series to series. Yeah. Um, I do think the other thing too, Katie, and this is maybe the thing the Raptors got to figure out the most. And this is again one of those sort of longer term. This is a problem for one year. A very serious playoff team is um, 
just still not going out of style to have like mid range assassins in the NBA in the playoffs. Like Tatum and Brown, Anthony Edwards, Doncic, Kyrie, Siakam, we saw last night kind of keep the Pacers in that game just by hitting a slew of mid range jumpers over Al Horford. Like, you know, that's still like much like the offensive rebounding thing. That, that's the ugly ball that you need. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the Raptors currently possess someone who is that sort of mid range marksman. I think Scotty Barnes can get there. He had a career best season from long mid range this season. Um, you know how he improves upon his sort of short mid range is a fascinating thing for next season after, you know, a bit of a two year slide after his rookie season, but pulling up for mid range, pretty encouraging, still nowhere near enough sample to say like, this is a thing Scotty Barnes does, but, Having some mid-range assassins uh, seems to be quite valuable. If only the Raptors had one of those on their team before the deadline. Did they? Just to say. Um, Katie, do you have any last parting shots here before we wrap things up? No. Just enjoy the playoffs. Enjoy the playoffs. They rock. It's mm -hmm. been so fun. I've been having an absolute blast. Mm -hmm. Wolves map should be great or... I can't decide if this is going to be a great series or if the Wolves are going to absolutely walk the floor uh, with or wipe the floor, walk the floor, wipe I the floor. I think it'll be good. That's I think it'll be good. I mean, if we're talking about adjustments, I think like Luca's frustration can just force those. I am kind of mm -hmm. curious to see how Jason Kidd coaches this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll he keeps see. on masquerading like he's a good coach, I'm waiting for the bottom to fall out at some point. <laughs> they re signed him. Yeah. So, yeah. Many more years. There, there will be another fallow period in the Jason Kidd era, one would think. There's always a couple over the his time coaching a team, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, one can only hope. Uh, Katie, we will leave it there. Thank you so much, as always, for hanging out. It's an absolute blast, blast to chat with you. Anything you want to promote for the good people out there? Yeah, um, you already mentioned it, but my WNBA column with the Believer is going strong. The uh, first column went out last week. I already wrote the second, but that that'll come. Those are out every Friday. Um, awesome. Basketball feelings is also going strong with its exit series. There's been some really amazing guest contributions so far, uh, and me kind of plugging plugging the holes. <laughs> but <laughs> you can read that at Basketball Feelings. And then I just had Charlotte Wilder uh, on the Basketball Feelings podcast, and I think Wait. that just went out near moments ago. Wow! Wow! Mm -hmm. Real time podcast posting. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Everyone go subscribe to Basketball Feelings. It's the very best. Go read Believer uh, and Katie's wonderful work on the WNBA over there. And we'll be back again tomorrow as our pal Jamar Hines makes his triumphant return to the podcast as we're going to play a game of what's more <laughs> likely. Also, hoping maybe question mark uh, before our pal Vivek Jacob goes away to cover the Cricket World Cup. We can get the episode doing our over-unders breakdown with him and Sahal in on Friday. Still working on that. If that doesn't work, we will do that upon Vivek's return in the off-season and have that be a little off-season special in June or whatever. But, um, yeah, that's what we got for now. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thanks for supporting the show. Follow, subscribe, rate, review on your favorite Apple or Google or Spotify, whatever audio app you use. And, of course, we're on YouTube as well. Go subscribe, hit the notification bell, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk to you again on Thursday, another episode of Lockdown Raptors. Thanks for hanging. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.